In your journey toward commission, you will experience ways that your organization faithfully images God and ways that your organization falsely images God. God seeks to redeem these false images and transform them into redeemed images. God redeems the nations, which are the secular organizations of today, from their idolatry, which is their organizational sin. His plan involves sending his people to serve as light for the nations. God has sent you as an insider light to guide your organization on its next steps towards redemption. How do we figure out the practical details of being a light for the nations? This is where each of you will need to learn to download God's guidance in an ongoing fashion. You need to download guidance for yourself because each of your organizational lives is unique. One of you might be a mid-level manager, another might be an individual contributor, another might be the CEO. And your organizations come in all sizes and types. The particular organizational sins each of you will encounter will have their own variations. Furthermore, your organizational situations and roles, well, they're likely to change over time. It would be impossible to produce a rigid, one-size-fits-all, step-by-step recipe for all organizational situations. Each of you will need to learn how to download God's ongoing guidance for your particular organizational role. And that's the goal for this session, to show you how to download God's ongoing guidance for you in your roles. And we're going to show you how to download this guidance through the most reliable source of God's guidance, through the scriptures. To learn to use scripture to download practical guidance, let's start with our biblical role models of insider light. How did they receive practical guidance while they served in the secular organizations of their day? Think about Daniel. Daniel is arguably the best example of an insider light we have from the Old Testament. He wore a variety of organizational hats in the Babylonian Empire, encountering one tricky form of institutional idolatry after another. Daniel navigated these changing roles and challenges brilliantly, faithfully, and with far-reaching impact on that institution. He even illuminated how God's redemptive plan involved other nations beyond Babylon. How did he do this? Where did he get his practical guidance? For Daniel and the other examples, a critical source of guidance was the regular practice of prayer. In multiple passages, Daniel is described as engaged in daily prayer where he received very specific guidance about his organizational role. Developing your own practice of regular prayer for your organization will be absolutely critical if you wish to download God's ongoing guidance. However, Prayer was not the only source of ongoing guidance for Daniel. The other source was the scriptures, specifically the law. Israel's law consistently shaped how Daniel behaved in his various roles, how he would partake or not partake of the organizational culture, what organizational rituals he would engage in or avoid, and how he would interpret organizational developments. Daniel believed that the law was meant to be a key source of guidance for all Jews who, like him, had been sent as insiders into the nations. For instance, in a long passage in Daniel 9, Daniel laments how his fellow exiles had neglected the law's guidance. In Daniel 9, 7 to 10, he says, Those who are near and those who are far away in all the lands to which you have driven them have not obeyed the voice of the Lord our God, by walking in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. In order for us to download God's ongoing guidance, we need to pay attention to Daniel's warning. Daniel 9 provides our key tip for today. We need to read the law as practical guidance for our organizational role. Now, this will probably be a new and perhaps strange tip for many of you, after all, when was the last time you read Leviticus or Deuteronomy 
or some other section of Old Testament law for practical guidance on anything, much less your organizational life. Most Christians skip right over the law because they are reading it with just their individual hat on, looking for guidance in their private life or individual behavior. Christians will find only limited benefit in this approach because the law is not primarily concerned with individual behavior. Rather, the law is mostly concerned with institutional behavior. The majority of the legal codes in the Old Testament are especially designed to show Israel how to be a redeemed organization. Remember that God redeemed Israel out of captivity, captivity within the oppressive institution of Egypt, and also captivity to the institutional idolatry of the surrounding nations. God redeemed Israel and then gave Israel the law to show Israel, here, here is how you are to behave as a redeemed organization. When you read the law as a description of what a redeemed organization looks like, you'll then discover there's a great deal in the law that can potentially serve as practical guidance for what God's redemption looks like for your institution. Now, here and there, you may need some additional biblical knowledge to translate across different historical contexts. And, of course, you'll need to read with the Holy Spirit as guidance for your reading. Let me offer a couple of brief examples of how the law illuminates God's redemption of an organization. Suppose there's a company that, like Babel, has been infected by the mutation of interdependence into forced dependence. Suppose this company demands from its employees long working hours that makes it especially hard for a particular group, say, women who are working mothers. These working mothers depend on their job to meet pressing financial needs for their family. So they're essentially forced to take on this heavy workload. But this load causes their family lives to suffer, which means they are now not providing for their family emotionally. They can't win. These women keep falling further and further in the hole. What guidance might the law offer for redeeming this Babel? Let's look at Leviticus 25. There, God prescribes for Israel the law of the Jubilee. The essence of the Jubilee law is that every 50 years, all long-term debt loads were to be forgiven in Israel. Without the Jubilee, poor debtors would often keep falling deeper into the hole. To meet one pressing need, they would take on one debt load, and then to make payments on that first debt load, they would have to take even more debt load elsewhere, and so on and so on. They couldn't win. Over time, they would just keep falling deeper into the hole until lenders would eventually force the debtors into a state of total dependence. And that is when their entire families would be forced into slavery with no way out for subsequent generations. The institutional practice of Jubilee was designed by God to repair this mutation. By forgiving all long-term debts and freeing all slaves every 50 years, the law ensured that no family got so deeply into the hole that subsequent generations were forced into total dependency and permanent slavery. What might the Jubilee look like for the company I described? What institutional practices could be implemented to forgive the load placed on those working mothers? Could the Jubilee look like more flexible hours, on-site childcare, more allowance for working from home, or other liberating practices to protect subsequent generations. Now, it will of course take discernment and creativity to translate the Jubilee principle into the particulars of a given organization today. This is why God intends for the law to be read with the additional guidance of the Holy Spirit. The role of the Spirit is to spark the creative and inspired translations of the law. Reading scripture in combination with regular prayer is how we download God's guidance. Let me give you one more example of how the law describes a redeemed organization. Many publicly traded corporations have had their overflowing love mutated into self-focused love. This mutation stems from how corporations make decisions by slavishly 
obeying the doctrine of maximizing shareholder return. In this doctrine, the boundaries of the corporation's interests are defined narrowly by just those who own stock. So the corporation must do whatever it takes to raise the stock price to benefit those who own stock. All other interests are pushed aside. Maximizing shareholder return is a powerful and prevalent form of idolatry in the corporate world. What might the law say about this practice? Try reading Leviticus 19. It describes the law of gleanings. This law prohibited landowners from harvesting their crops right up to the edge of their fields. They had to leave the crops untouched near the edges and leave it for the poor and immigrants of their community. In other words, they could not maximize shareholder return. The law of gleaning sought to redeem Israel from this self-focused love and transform it to more overflowing love. It was meant to remind the holders of Israel's land that imaging God meant making room for the outsiders. What might the law of gleanings look like for redeeming Babel today? Well, there are signs that God is already at work to break the idolatry of maximizing shareholder return. There's a movement underway that I believe is the Holy Spirit at work in the secular world that's pushing to expand a corporation's definition of its shareholders such that it overflows to include the environment, future generations, the supply chain in the developing world, and others. Christians are active in this movement and have much guidance to offer. And in your own company, even if it is not publicly traded, you might look for others who are interested in corporate philanthropy, where a greater portion of corporate profits are reserved as gleanings for the most vulnerable in your community. Perhaps you could be a light in your company, pointing the way towards this kind of practice. These are just a couple of examples of the guidance that the law can provide. Aren't you curious? What redemptive ideas the law, read in combination with the Holy Spirit, could generate for your organization? However, Christians working in secular organizations are not taught to read the law for guidance because of a common misunderstanding of the purpose of the law. The misunderstanding is that the law was only meant for Israel, not the nations. Thus, people who hold this understanding might be open to translating the laws of jubilee or gleanings for Christian organizations, but would say, but these legal codes were never meant to guide secular organizations that don't follow God. This is a misunderstanding of God's intentions for both Israel and the law. Recall that there are two modes of how Israel was supposed to serve as light for the nations, the beacon on the hill mode, and the insider light mode. The law indeed was meant to guide Israel's own institutional practices in its beacon mode. But what is the purpose of a beacon? A beacon is not meant just to keep its light shining on itself. The beacon exists to guide the behavior of others outside its own hill. When God first gave the law to Israel in the book of Deuteronomy, he made it clear that he gave Israel the law so that it ultimately would guide the nations. Deuteronomy 4, 6-8 says, Keep them and do them. The them God is referring to are the statutes of the law. For that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. The peoples here are the surrounding people in the surrounding nations who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation, meaning Israel, is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all of this law that I set before you today? From the beginning, the law was intended by God to reach the nations. The peoples of the nations were to, as God says in Deuteronomy, hear all these statutes of the law. And how was that to happen? How would all the nations hear? Well, the most insightful of Israel's thinkers, like the prophet Isaiah, realized that the peoples of the nations would hear about God's redemptive purposes through God's people being sent into the nations. In other words, the beacon on the hill mode 
and the insider light mode were supposed to work together to guide the nations. Isaiah chapter 2 explains this combination. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many. And Isaiah 51, 4 says, Give attention to me, my people, Israel, and give ear to me, my nation, for a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the nations. To summarize, the law is God's redemption code, also for secular organizations. And as God's people go out into the nations, we are meant to carry that code with us into those institutions. This means that for your secular organization to access God's redemption code, it does not have to become an explicitly Christian organization. The entire management team or the CEO does not need to convert to Christianity. Rather, the very fact that God has placed you in some spot on the org chart, no matter where it is, means that the organization can access God's redemption code. Because you are the download point. This leads us to the next bit of guidance we need. How do we influence our organization with what we have received? If we are meant to be the download point for God's redemption code, how do we distribute that code within our organization? Once again, the law, read in prayerful combination with the Spirit, can provide some practical guidance. Israel's law describes different modes of influence within a redeemed organization. In fact, the law assigned these modes of influence to particular organizational roles. Three organizational roles especially stand out in the scriptures, the roles of prophet, priest, and king. Now, each of these roles corresponds to a mode of organizational influence. The prophet diagnoses organizational sin. The priest repairs relationships, and the king protects the whole. These roles are outlined in the law. And remember that the law was meant to guide God's people both as they are a beacon on a hill and as they are insider lights. So the roles of prophet, priest, and king also apply to how God's people are to exercise influence within secular organizations. This is why the biblical stories of insider lights so often match up to these roles. For instance, Jeremiah and Jonah served in prophet-like roles, diagnosing the sin of the nations. Abraham and Ezra played priestly roles, seeking the repair of various relationships. Joseph and Esther ended up in king and queen-like positions of authority in the nations. So let's dive a little deeper into each role. The prophet is the one who sees most clearly how the organization is failing to image God properly. Throughout the Old Testament, it was the prophet who was supposed to spot and name institutional idolatry. Frequently, the prophet will perceive organizational sin where others in the organization think eh, nothing is particularly wrong. Remember that organizational sin tends to be subtle. It's easy to miss and it's easy to justify. It seems that God gives his prophets special insight to penetrate the self-justifications and name the problems truthfully. The prophetic role also requires communicating this diagnosis to the rest of the organization. Prophets don't just keep their insights to themselves. They're driven to share them with others. In fact, prophets seem to be especially gifted in communicating truth in evocative and creative ways. The prophets in the Old Testament often told clever stories, enacted powerfully symbolic performances, or wrote beautiful poetry so that others in the institution could grasp their diagnosis of sin. You may be the kind of person that naturally perceives where things have gone wrong in your organization. You may also be the kind of person that feels compelled to help others see what you see. You may have creative gifts of communication to explain truth in powerful ways. Those are all clues that God has assigned you the role of prophet within your organization. Now, whereas the prophet's role is to diagnose and explain organizational sin, the priest's role is to facilitate repair. 
Since organizational sin is primarily about broken relationships, the priest's mode of influence is repairing relationships. For Old Testament Israel, the response to sin began with repairing the relationship between the organization and God. The priests were responsible for representing Israel in confessing their sins to God and seeking forgiveness. So, if you find yourself moved to pray for your organization, this may be a sign that God is calling you to a priestly role. This is especially likely if you often feel moved to pray for broken internal relationships within your organization. This is why, in addition to repairing the relationship between the people and God, Israel's priests were also tasked with repairing damaged relationships between the people. In the law, when something had gone wrong, like an injury, a crime, or a sickness that distorted relationships between people, the priest played a key role in the restoration of those relationships. If you are someone that thinks a lot about the nuances of relational dynamics and really enjoy investing in the health of relationships, you may very well have a priest-like calling. One clue is that others in the organization naturally go to you when something has broken down relationally. Priestly people are good at skills like facilitating, bridging, and mediating. Finally, I should also note that people who are skilled in the priest role seem to combine the strong relational sensitivity with an intention to process. The Old Testament law contains a great deal of details about organizational process. This is found in the codes around clean and unclean rituals. When we read many of those clean and unclean codes with just our individual hat, we tend to think the preoccupation with rituals is weird and unnecessary. But when we read those laws with the organization hat, we can see that those rituals were just ancient Israel's version of organizational process. These rituals allowed everyone to share a clear and consistent process around common food, health, meetings, governance, and other aspects of life together. Clean simply means this is the right process that promotes agreement. Unclean means this is the wrong process that will cause disagreement. Perhaps you are someone who cares about organizational process, not just for the sake of following rules, but because you grasp that clean organizational processes are necessary to life together. You get that when an organization lacks clear and consistent processes around things like hiring, pay, benefits, or how work gets distributed, how to communicate, that's when relationships can get infected with jealousy, resentment, or misunderstanding. A priest is someone who cares about organizational process because they care about relational health. The final role in Israel's org chart that I want to discuss is the role of the king. I would summarize the king's mode of influence as protect the whole. By the way, I use the term king because that's the term most commonly used in the Bible, but this role is meant for men and women equally. So feel free to translate king in your mind to queen. For Old Testament Israel, the king was responsible for making sure that the entire organization of Israel was protected against threats to the proper imaging of God. The king protected the operating code intended by God. They protected against mutations. For example, it was the king that was to defend the whole of Israel against foreign threats that could force the nation into dependence and slavery. The king was to make sure that the resources of society did not remain narrowly concentrated on a few wealthy elites, but that abundance overflowed to the poor and vulnerable. And it was the king who was to guard against systematic corruption in the purpose of the courts. All of this meant that the king had to keep an eye on the whole picture. So, if you are someone that likes to think big, that sees how different parts of an institution fit together, that is an indication you are suited to play the role of a king or queen. A king is someone who not only is motivated to see the whole picture, but also to try to see around the corner. The king's role is to think ahead, to plan, to anticipate on behalf of the whole organization. 
If you are the kind of person who does that naturally, that's an indicator that perhaps God has assigned that kind of role to you. Finally, it's important to note that the king or queen is entrusted with power and authority. Protecting the whole requires power and authority. But Israel's kings were warned to never seek that power and authority for themselves, for the sake of having power and authority, but rather in order to serve the whole. People who are called into king-like roles by God are ones who have a servant heart. They're motivated to use power and authority to benefit others, to protect the whole. That's another indicator. The more you have a track record of serving others and of using power to benefit others, the more likely it is that God may be assigning you to the role of king or queen. Now, keep in mind that God may call you to play multiple roles over your lifetime, and the blend may change over time. For instance, in my early career, I was often put in organizational positions where I had to play much more the role of the king. I was okay playing that role, but over time, I discern that I've been particularly wired by God with the mindset of a prophet. I love diagnosing an organization's condition and communicating that diagnosis in evocative ways. That was a big reason why I felt God calling me to become a consultant. I still serve in king-like roles in different organizations, but the prophet-like roles are where I especially thrive, at least for this season of my life. You too will thrive more as you discern the particular blend of roles that God has for you in this season. How will you discern this? Well, hopefully by now, the recipe for downloading God's guidance for your organizational life is clear. The recipe is a combination of scripture with prayer, the law with the spirit. And here I need to add a third component to the recipe, your Christian community. Go back to the example of Daniel. Daniel did read scripture and he prayed, and he also was supported by his fellow Jewish exiles, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So look for a Christian community that can support you in your commission. If there are other Christians also within your organization, that's a great place to start. Strongly consider asking them to meet for scripture and prayer together in the workplace. But your support can also be found in Christian community outside the workplace, like your church small group. Make it a regular part of your small group time to share about and pray for each other's journey towards commission. You are not alone. God is sending you, and God almost always sends someone through a community. 